Welcome to episode 148 of the Grip Strip Podcast, the football and IndyCar season recap edition of the GSP. My name is Philip Matthew. I'm your host, and I'm here with my co-host. Got to go and get the open right. Um, I have it over here. So he's a computer genius, an iRacing Indy 500 champion, a gentleman, and a scholar. His name is Joshua Fine. What's going on, man? Yeah, I'm doing great, Phil. Yeah, as always, thank you for the intro there. Um, yeah, doing doing great. Uh, Jacksonville Jaguars curb stomp the Tennessee Titans. So glad to see it happen. Uh, no better team to see it happen against than the Tennessee Titans hate him uh never gonna never gonna like him um you know so glad that the the Jags got the W finally in Tennessee uh in Nashville uh and you know this weekend finally got my uh new pedal set for my simulator got the uh um Fanatec Club Sport V3 uh pedals so definitely uh you know been trying to figure that part out and um got it all set up and been trying to you know get adjusted and acclimated to these pedals because they're they're really fun so um you know being able to have a better experience on the sim racing deal which we'll we'll talk about later so yeah doing great and you know as always glad to be back on for another week absolutely we're gonna get into that with the sim and the sim segment just before the end of the show of course but uh before that we'll get into nfl talk uh both uh josh's jaguars and uh my 49ers uh purdy time in san francisco uh, going on there uh talking about a curb stomping uh mr irrelevant curb stomp the goat and then after that drake greenlaw and fred warner ran up to him asking for an autograph that's what but he signed it so god bless him he is a goat and he actually showed that there uh, we'll get in all the big, uh, different news stories that came out of this week and, uh, what to expect as we move into week 15. Uh, my fantasy teams are basically toast. Two of them. I, one of my teams lost by 0.32 of a point, which is atrocious. Um, the other one was pretty much gone to hell when T Higgins got out, but, uh, and then I have one team. I lost to the number one team in the league. And had the second highest point score. So I mean, I I will end up finishing third this week in the in the points, but I ended up losing to the best team in the league. So I still have a chance there. Hopefully, um, the uh, we'll get into the the fantasy. We'll get into the our teams. We'll recap the the rest of the league and what's going on, and then we'll get into the IndyCar season review. Plenty to talk about there. Uh, Plenty of Penske talk, of course. A little bit of uh, Ganassi. This the battle that has existed since 1996 uh, still continues, and it was very Penske and Ganassi centric. But Pato Award had moments. Colton Hurdle won one race. Probably the two best prospects to go possibly go to Formula One in a long time. But through whatever way you want to look at it, neither of them at the moment are in a in a in the mix to actually get a ride, uh, but they're getting testing time. So who knows what might happen with that. Uh, Other news that's come out, we'll get into um, in the GSP roundup. So we'll talk about all the things, IndyCar, the rookie battle, um, et cetera, et cetera. Plenty of uh, tidbits going on uh, in the roundup with SRX. Got some NASCAR news. Uh, Takuma Sato might be driving the 11 uh, for Ganassi in the ovals on the ovals because um, I forget Marcus Armstrong I think is driving all the other other road courses S- Formula One news and then uh, there was testing for the Rolex Twenty Four with the GTP cars uh, this past weekend getting all that Josh will talk about uh, his his new setup and all things sim racing before we uh, close the deal so the Jacksonville Jaguars kind of it continued to expose the Tennessee Titans for what they are. And there's an irony since I'm watching Monday night football and um, the new England Patriots, which is, I mean, what is his name? Mike Vrabel is probably the only Belichick zealot that has been successful, but it's smoke and mirrors this year because they don't have a wide receiver. They traded away their wide receiver uh, and, for a bucket of balls, I guess. And uh, they have no wide receivers. Tannehill looks ordinary now. Um, and when Derrick Henry cannot go and be Derrick Henry, 
they're not that good. But it also helps when you have a quarterback who's taking that next step towards what everyone as like many has expected of him. Um, it's crazy that he didn't win a Heisman personally. I don't know how he didn't win the Heisman, but Trevor Lawrence is making making moves now. And uh, to think about early in the season when you were trying to roast him on a spit and and, uh, and send him out of here to now he looks like the guy. Uh, Jacksonville has hope. It's a, it's a shame that the some of the games earlier in the season didn't go the right way for you guys or else you'd be in the mix for that four seed um, in a matchup with, I guess, the Miami Dolphins at the moment. I don't know who who would be the team there, but plenty of hope coming for uh, the Jacksonville Jaguars because you got a quarterback there, Josh. Yeah, I mean, we definitely got a quarterback in Trevor Lawrence for sure. And, you know, going back to what I was talking about earlier in the year, you know, I mean, really it was because – you know, those were all winnable games. And, you know, the, when you have games that are right there for you to win, you know, you got to be able to um, win those games. And, you know, the Jaguars now are two games behind the Tennessee Titans. And, you know, they were, you know, had they won those games that they should have won when Trevor um, was making all those mistakes, you know, they could either, you know, have a better chance at winning the division or they'd be right in the thick of it. And they are kind of right in the thick of it, right? Because you know, they're only two games behind right now. Uh, Tennessee can't, you know, they, they've been losing, and so there's a chance there. But certainly they'd be in a better spot if they had won some of those games they lost earlier in the season. You know, go back to Houston Texans, 13-6 uh, to six loss there. Trevor throwing a pick in the red zone. Uh, you know, you have the loss to New York Giants. Uh, you know, the loss to the Houston Texans. You know, the, they had, or the, you know, I already saw when the loss to the Denver Broncos, um, you know, the losses to the Eagles and the, the Washington Commanders, you know, so a lot of losses there early on that they could have had uh, back if, you know, they won, would have won at least, you know, two or three of those, they'd um, be a lot closer to the Titans, but there's still a chance. And so, you know, I still have hope, you know, that we can win out, you know, we just got to beat the Cowboys, you know, if they can beat the Cowboys, then, you know, they'll I think they had a chance against the New York Jest. Uh, notice, you know, Jest, not the Jets, the Jest, because uh, they're a joke. Uh, you know, the Jets, I think, are the weakest team currently that has a, you know, in, in playoff contention with a winning record. So, um, you know, they've just been not not great. You know, they haven't been able to figure out their quarterback situation or anything like that. Uh, so I think they got a chance to defeat them on Thursday night here in two weeks. Uh, you know, the Texans, a uh, don't think they'd be fooled twice by Texans. You know, I think they can curb stomp them in uh, Houston, um, and then then the home uh, fi- uh, finale against Tennessee, uh, and which will if if they win all those and they go to you know Tennessee and Tennessee loses, uh, which I think they can lose the next game against the uh, Chargers, and then they got one against the Cowboys, and they goes on be real tough for the Titans. But you know they go go down to Jacksonville uh, last weekend of the year. Uh, for the regular season um, should be a chance to go win the uh, division for both of those teams. And, you know, I'd like Jacksonville's chances in that one. So still not over yet. So uh, we'll take it one game at a time, but you know, there's still uh, opportunity there. Um, so we'll see what happens next week against the uh, Cowboys. But yeah, you know, in the game, Trevor Lawrence, um, you know, he had a pretty good series uh, in starting the third quarter. You know, he, uh, the first, you know, first quarter wasn't, uh, they weren't able to move the ball as much, but, uh, you know, Trevor, uh, had a good ending to the half, the, the touchdown, toe tapping touchdown to Zay Jones. And then in the third quarter, they just began the game, uh, the, the half really nicely. Uh, he had a lot of completions, um, where he was moving around in the pocket and able to make throws off platform, off balance and able to make those completions. And, um, you know, then he went and, uh, stiff armed the Titans linebacker at the goal line to make it, uh, you know, rushing touchdown so you know trevor's in his bag right now that's what i've been saying uh during that game as i was saying to myself so uh you know trevor's got uh, you know uh, the ability now i think you know it was just a matter of being patient with him so i'm um, glad that he's able to do it and you know it, it didn't even really look all that exciting really like it wasn't like flashy or like big plays down the field but just solid move the chains uh find the the guy uh the best guy and you know make the play and uh, you know, he's able to do that and, you know, tie back into racing uh, in a minute. You know, I go back to, um, you know, some track record laps that we've seen over the years that they didn't look all that fast. And um, then, 
when you look at it, it's like, oh, that was a track record. Like, you know, Joe DeFerrin, Auto, yeah, Auto Club Speedway back in 2000. And, I mean, didn't look like a real fast lap there, but yet it was the uh, closed course super speedway record on ovals for uh, IndyCar. So, and I, I think in all, all forms of motorsports. So, um, you know, not everything has to be all exciting to, to be the best. And, uh, you know, with uh, the game that Trevor Lawrence had on, on Sunday, I mean, it's, it, it's probably arguably one of the best quarterback performances of all time for a, a Jacksonville Jaguars quarterback. So, um, you know, that's a, uh, really great to have and uh you know, he had over you know 350 yards passing three touchdowns um and a bunch of completion 70 percent over 70 percent completion rate so um great uh great game for him overall and hey, let's talk about the defense as well you know trayvon walker started the party really got the uh sack on ryan Tannehill early in the game and forced the fumble uh and turnover on you know for the jaguars and they're able to go and take advantage of that and score. And then, you know, later on forced the fumble on Derrick Henry and just, you know, sucked his soul right there. Uh, quarter linebacker, Sh- uh, Shaq Quarterman from Oak Leaf high school, my, uh, high school in, uh, in, uh, Jacksonville area. Um, you know, he was able to go out and make that fumble happen. And, um, uh, you know, then Josh Allen was able to pick it up. So yeah, that's, a uh, you know, the turnovers are back for the Jaguars. They're there early in the season, and now they were able to get, you know, three really good turnovers. So, um, you know, this, this team, you know, if they can fe- be focused, you know, they can, uh, you know, go out and uh, get these Ws. I mean, they're going to be a team to watch if they do make the playoffs. So, you know, we'll have to see. But, yeah, just a really good overall team victory and, you know, hope hope to see it continue. Yeah, I mean, you guys uh, kind of gotten on a run here similar to the Detroit Lions who um, have gotten crazy and look like a team that could, you know, with the way the NFC is, if they get in the playoffs, it could be really crazy. MCDC, um, you know, getting Jared Goff back um, to what he was prior to, you know, getting sent from the chart, uh, the LA Rams. And then, um, you know, that, I mean, there's different points there you made. I mean, Jaguars are, have a, have a lot of talent, and um, you have the coach with Doug Peterson, and there's a lot of uh, hope there, and um, that's a good thing. It hasn't been the case for a while um, for you guys, so at least with Trevor, with a lot of the pieces that are there, he seemingly he's re Evan Ingram has come out of high. He he's become what everyone thought he was going to be when they draft the Giants drafted him. You know, you've got Zay Jones, who was a bum for the Buffalo Bills and other teams, and now he's here in, J- in Jacksonville doing work. You got, of course, Travis Etienne, uh, the teammate of uh, Trevor Lawrence at college in Clemson. Uh, I mean, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of piece on offense. Trayvon Walker's number one overall pick in the NFL draft. You have other defensive players there. There's a lot of potential, and that division's wide open. The Texans are dumpster fire. Um, the... Uh, trying to remember who the other team is in your division other than the Texans and Tennessee. Indianapolis is like nobody knows what's going to happen there. They don't have a quarterback. Houston doesn't have a quarterback. And Tennessee doesn't have enough skill position players to compete on offense. They put too much pressure on their interior four. And if they're not able to get the pressure, the back seven is not exactly the best. They do have good, I mean, David Long is a good linebacker when he's in there. He wasn't in yesterday with injury, but the guy that replaced him, I think, did all right. Um, Secondary has never been a strong suit under Mike Vrabel's uh, uh, coaching here on Tennessee, even though they've had good players. Uh, So, I mean, it's crazy. Last year, they were the number one overall seed, and uh, they got summarily bounced by Joe Burrow um, out of the playoffs. So, now they don't have A.J. Brown, and they look pretty ordinary. Um, I was hoping that Trevor Lawrence would have gotten the the seven more yards. I'd have gotten a bonus bonus points. Still wouldn't have mattered in my league, but it would have just been cool uh, to see, see that happen because he had such a great game. So uh, it's unfortunate there. Wasted. I mean, uh, I basically, the quarterback play, we stayed, I stayed with uh, – uh, the number one team in the league. And so, I mean, two of my teams are out now and uh, one of them is just brutal the way we lost uh, because of uh, the end of the game there for Justin Herbert. Yep. Uh, but, but uh, you know, I'm in this league, in my league, I'm going to back in 
looks like with uh, under 500 record. But, you know, you just have to make it to the dance. You never know what's going to happen after that. So um, we'll see with that. But in terms of the Niners, uh, the good Brock Purdy goes out there. Mr. Relevant, uh, all the nicknames, all the goofy name things are calling Brock Purdy. But the fact is he is an animal. I, I, I mean, he looks, he has no fear and he makes the throws. Like, I think he makes all the throws that Kyle Shanahan wants. And he looks like he's free the way he he plays. Jimmy, you always wonder what the heck was he was going to do. He was going to throw a hospital ball and get somebody killed or, you know, the, like George Kittle or whatever, or he'll throw a terrible interception. I mean, you, I mean, the reality is Brock Purdy for basically a game and a half or game and three quarters has been – nothing short of amazing for getting him at two that the last pick in the draft but there's pieces that you can look at you can go back and look at a four-year starter in college a guy who put up numerous records at Iowa State there's a lot going on there um and in the end the Niners now are gonna still be able as long as he stays upright you know please keep him upright because we've already lost Trey earlier this year and um then Jimmy Hemi is going to be waiting until January to play again. Uh, Debo Samuel, I thought it was really bad. What has come out to is a high ankle, which is not great, but high ankle sprain, MCL sprain. And um, he's on his Twitter saying he's okay. He'll be all right. Looks like he's going to miss probably most of the rest of the regular season, uh, but he'll be back in time for a likely playoff run. Uh, they can really make and and the Niners dominated the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. It was twenty eight nothing at the half. Tom Brady looked ordinary, uh, the greatest of all time. Got baptized by Mister Irrelevant, but that defense is absolutely ridiculous. It's the one of the best defenses in recent memory. And just getting there, if they can get there, and they have a chance right now. The way that the games went yesterday, they might be able to sneak a two seed. Um, if things kind of roll and things keep on rolling the way they are for the Niners, they could sneak the two seed and have a little more favorable matchup at home and then would control their destiny outside of having to go to the NFC Championship game and play in Philly. Um, so that, that'll that be the case if things kind of hold. But um, yeah, Brady did not look good through a couple picks. They had nothing the whole game, couldn't really do anything. And then the Tampa Bay defense just it didn't matter whether it was Brandon Ayuk. They couldn't really defend him. They couldn't really defend Debo. And forget Christian McCaffrey. Are you kidding me? Like Christian McCaffrey, there's a reason why he's considered one of the best running backs or all-around players in the NFL. It's just that he played for the Carolina Panthers. Now he's playing for Kyle Shanahan. He's playing for an actual football team. And all of a sudden, CMC is doing what, you know, everybody figured he would do, you know. Uh, that's the that's the the short and sweet of it. And uh, the Niners have a game on Thursday against Seattle in Seattle. If they can win it, they can win the they can win the division. Um it's got shades of twenty nineteen when it was game two fifty six or whatever. Uh when Dre Greenlaw made a goal line stop on whatever the tight end was for Seattle. And that stop gave Niners the number one seed, and they rode that to the Super Bowl. So, I mean, we'll see what happens with that. The Niners definitely uh, have a lot of good vibes going on, even with some of the injuries. Lost Dante Johnson for the year, but ACL. Yeah, so, I mean, we'll we'll see what happens with that. I mean, the other, other things with the NFL, just kind of go through some of the scores uh, this week. In uh, you know the uh, the some of the bigger things, yeah. I mean, Kyler, that's probably an ACL. If he fell down to a clump, then yeah, right tackle for the Cowboys torn ACL. So oh, that could be good. important for next week for Jacksonville. Yeah, so you're going to be able to rush. You're going to be able to rush uh, getting uh, Dax Kitchen, but it won't matter to me because I'm out of the playoffs anyway. So I don't care. He can get run over. Uh, the Rams with Baker Mayfield. Uh, basic eliminated the Raiders. Baker Mayfield was picked up the scrap heap and had two days. 
maybe a day, and he went in there and, and got the Rams a win. Bills hold on. They almost lost again to the Jets, but their defense basically murdered Mike White, and uh, that was the difference. Joe Burrow finally beats the Cleveland Browns, and uh, you know the, that was a big deal for them. The Cowgirls literally had to have a last-second 98-yard drive to all to to beat the Texans, uh, which I mean you. Josh already brought up the fact that the only win that the Texans have was against Jacksonville, unfortunately. Yep. And, um, you know, the Vikings losing to Motor City, Dan Campbell's Detroit Lions. They're now in the mix for the playoffs because the Giants are scuffling. The Washington uh, Redskin general commanders, uh, they're off this week, but, you know, they're they're kind of limited. Uh, Baltimore fades the Steelers with their third quarterback, when um, when uh, Kenny Pickett got knocked out with a concussion and then Mitchell Trubisky proved why he's a bust, throwing three picks in the red zone to um, essentially knock him out um, and basically end their season. It's going to be hard uh, to come back when you're three games under with four to play. Of course, we went over Jacksonville's win. Uh, Kermit the Frogs uh, Chiefs, he went and did one of his highlight reel plays. They were up big. Game looked over. They went and let the Broncos back in. Uh, what is it? Brett Rippon came in for Russell Wilson, who got hurt, went and drove him down the field. It was a one-possession game. In the end, the Broncos didn't have enough. Uh, they lost by six to the Chiefs, and the Chiefs are still the two. Carolina went to Seattle, and Steve Wilkes is Carolina Panthers with uh, Sam Darnold, at quarterback, go and win and knock right now as of now the Seattle is out of the playoffs um, and the Niners have a two game lead in division. And if they can beat the Seahawks, they'd have the head to head on both the Seahawks, but they'd sweep the Seahawks. They've already swept the Rams. And the, and now the, I mean, to be fair, the Arizona Cardinals are done anyways now. So um, that would lock up the division. Tampa Bay still leads the NFC South. That, that field must be really bad considering how many people are getting hurt today, honestly. But then field conditions, they don't bother. The NFL doesn't care about players um, that with all the injuries that seem to happen in the league and shitty field conditions. Um, the Chargers come through, beat the Dolphins. So two consecutive games where Tua Tungavailoa looks pretty ordinary and that offense is being able to be stopped. So maybe the Mike McDaniel shine is starting to go away, but I kind of feel like he's going to figure it out um, and and put them in a place to still make the playoff. Uh, but you know that's a uh, that's a uh, I'm tr- what is it week fourteen? Do they yes yeah, standings? Here we go. That's what I wanted to see. So uh, standings puts um, playoff picture. There you go. So the playoff picture right now as it stands. The Eagles are clinched a playoff spot and uh, are two games ahead of the Cowgirls uh, with, and and I think they probably play each other again. The Bills are the number one seed right now in the uh, AFC with the Chiefs right behind them. They have the head-to-head. The Ravens are third, but they're now down to their third quarterback. Titans are fourth uh, in uh, because they are in the AFC South. The Bengals stay at five, and they're tied with the Ravens. It's the head-to-head, which is the difference there. Uh, Miami Dolphins are six even with the loss. The LA Chargers move up to the last playoff spot uh, with the loss for the Jets. If the Patriots come through and win today, they'll be the seven seed, and the Jets will drop to the nine. Uh, The Jacksonville Jaguars are two games out of that right now, but they're making moves. The Raiders are dead. The Browns are dead. The Steelers are dead uh, for all intents and purposes. So are the Indianapolis Colts. Uh, Houston, Denver, and the Chicago Bears are already eliminated from uh, playoffs. And um, on the NFC side, Eagles, as I mentioned, Vikings right now are in the second spot. They're a game ahead of the Niners after the loss to the Lions. Buccaneers are 6-7. and seven. They'll be hosting a playoff game. Cowgirls are 5 the whole entire NFC East at this moment would make the playoffs. Cowboys, Washington, Giants, 
uh, Seahawks because of the tie between Washington and the New York Giants. That's the difference for the Seahawks. The Lions are trending. Uh, they are two games behind uh, the uh, one and a half games behind the Redskins and the or Commanders and the Giants. And um, so they, that's they're in play. Packers, I think, are toast. Uh, Carolina's. I think they're trying to play for Steve Wilkes. I don't think it'll matter, unfortunately. Um, he seems like he has a good rapport, and they, they're playing hard for him. But it isn't enough, really, I guess. for It won't be enough for the owner. I think I forget David Tepper is the owner. I think, yeah, David Tepper. Yeah. Falcons are going to be starting uh, Desmond Ritter uh, from Cincinnati, uh, University of Cincinnati, their rookie uh, draft pick. They're going to start him this coming week. So that they're basically throwing in the towel there. Uh, Cardinals, as I said, now with Kyler Murray falling over uh, are probably toast. They were toast anyways, but it's like really committed and confirmed. Uh, Saints, of course, they're a rudderless ship. And uh, the Rams, even though they beat the um, the Raiders, they're not going anywhere. They're going to end up having the the ignominious honor of being the worst team that's ever won a Super Bowl in the next year have the be one of the crappiest teams in the league. So that is what's going on in the NFL. Plenty of uh good games the next what is it four weeks all the everybody will be playing. So there'll be sixteen games. Um yeah so that's uh that. Um okay. Um I'm gonna go and just uh, mute over here, Josh. We're going to go and start the IndyCar part of the program here so we can talk about Will Power, who's a champion. Yeah, of course, you know, with Will Power, you know, winning his uh, title in, in uh, IndyCar this year in 2022, uh, you know, he won in 2014, right? Uh, and, you know, it was finally a title for him now. And now, once again, he's won a, a title and. Um, you know, he changed his mindset throughout the year. We, you know, he noticed that you know, Will Power had a, a lot more uh, calmer uh, mindset. You know, this year, you know, in the past, you know, we've seen Will get pretty volatile when things didn't go his way. But you know, throughout the season, uh, Will Power, you know, stayed calm, stayed consistent, didn't um, get too emotional or anything, and you know, he was able to go out and uh, secure the title in the IndyCar. Uh, so, you know, it was a, um, pretty significant, you know, title for him. You know, he's, uh, you know, been somebody that probably should have had more titles and, you know, now he's able to finally, uh, have multiple titles. So, um, you know, Will, Will, uh, only had one victory, but he was just super consistent throughout the year. You know, had a 5.9 average finish, uh, nine podiums, uh, five poles, uh, set the you know record for poles in IndyCar, uh, history, uh, you know, most career polls. So, you know, it's just been a phenomenal year for him, uh, you know, throughout, um, you know, this season. Uh, the only race you know, that he won was in Detroit at Bell, you know, Bell. Um, you know, he had a, a good car, a good day at Indianapolis Grand Prix where he uh, took the podium in, um, you know, ran pole at Iowa uh, both times, Gateway, and then the final race at Laguna Seca to get his, you know, final or his, uh, most career pulled of all time so you know it's um for willpower you know the, you know there are times this year where um he struggled a little bit you know didn't uh, have a great indianapolis 500 uh road america uh wasn't that great um you know toronto didn't have a great year or race there um nashville grand prix wasn't all all that great but you know throughout uh the rest of the year you know he had a lot of uh podiums or uh top tens um, and so that was the goal for him and, you know, go, go to, uh, the, the Portland test before you know, the weekend before the Portland race. And he actually, uh, crashed in that one, uh, and, you know, crashed in that test and th that could have been big for him, but, you know, they were able to recover from that. He was able to recover from that crash, uh, during testing. And then they came back and finished uh, second, you know, they led two laps in that race before, uh, the final race at Laguna Seca and, you know, he's able to, uh, go out there and, and, um, get, get on the podium at Laguna Seca to win the championship. So, um, just a phenomenal year for Will Power, uh, consistency wise. Um, and, you know, he's, um, maybe we see this again in, uh, 2023. We, um, I don't see a reason why not. I think he's probably got a couple more good years left in him, uh, being at his age. And, you know, I think, 
um, you know, I think Penske uh, has a chance overall as an organization to be really strong, you know, across their three drivers. So, yeah, I, I mean, it's just a, you know, good, really good year for, uh, you know, Penske overall. And, you know, Will Power was at the top of that. Yeah, I mean, he made an he made it a goal to be more consistent. He ends up le- running the most laps, tied for the most laps run. He or he ran every lap this year, actually. Him and Scott Dixon were only two that did that. Nine podiums, so more than half the season he was on the podium. His average start wasn't the best. Uh, somebody we're going to mention here shortly. His teammate was the best at that, but his average finish was five point nine. He only had three fin- four finishes outside of the top 10. Otherwise, he had every other finish was in the top six, which is absolutely nuts. Um, started the year with uh, at, from, from St. Pete all the way to Indianapolis Grand Prix 1, was third, fourth, 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 and third in the first five races. Then, you know, 500 didn't go so well for him. Wins at Belle Isle. Elkhart Lake didn't go so well for him. So he was on, off, on, off for the next few during the summer, that summer stretch. And then Iowa probably was the turning point where he qualified, as Josh mentioned, on pole, led laps both those races. And um, he had led the points earlier in the year. Uh, Belle Isle, he had taken the points lead and fallen back all the way to uh, third, and or fourth after the 500, and he got back to third, then second, and then uh, the Indianapolis GP2 during the NASCAR weekend. He took the points lead and never lost it. So for Will Power, he's been running many, how many years in IndyCar? Um, he since 2006, he's been in this series and in whatever essentially IndyCar competition. He's finished sixth and fourth uh, the two years in champ car he finished second in the points he's finished second in the points four times uh, three times prior to winning his first championship and then once since then he finished third twice so he's been around like he's been flirting with possibly going and getting that that second championship and it's interesting he's not winning as much as he used to he is qualifying just as good as he always has because he's the all-time pole winner. But this is statistically, I think, even in his championship year, in his championship year of 14, uh, he had a he had a little worse starting position, and he was a half a position higher um, in the finishing. So the reality is, it's it's likely his be- it's arguably his best year of his career, and at age 41. A couple of years ago, we didn't know if he was going to have a job. There was a thought he wasn't going to have a job. And now he's a two-time IndyCar champion. Verizon loves him. And uh, we're going to see what else he can do, how many polls he can win uh, and wins and whatnot. Now, somebody else that had uh, a really strong year in uh, 2022 but didn't have the same level of consistency was Joseph Newgarden, Will Power's teammate. He had the best, uh, tied for the best average start with uh, Pato Award, who we'll talk about later. He um, uh, was a Joe New, had five wins in uh, 2022, but there was this, she had some bad finishes. Indianapolis GP was 25th, and the 513th, that's one of the ones that is still eluding him. He's getting into that mix as the best driver never to win Indy 500. Uh, with the with his record that he has, uh, these finishes that he he had uh, what is it two finishes outside of the top twenty. Uh, he had a tenth there, at Toronto, whatever. But yeah, Iowa that, too. Yeah, the I like the the Birming the Birmingham uh, Baba uh, race, the Indy GP one and the five hundred. Those those finishes right there uh, knocked him down to fifth in points. He started on pole and he finished fourth at Belle Isle. He was still fifth. Wins or wins at at Road America gets the third. Got up as far as second. Wrecked in the second Iowa race while leading. Uh, was going to likely sweep that and it could have turned. That would have been a game changer if he had won that race. But he wrecked while leading. 
and uh, probably that was the end of the uh, his chance at the championship. Even though he still he won another race at Gateway and had, gave it a valiant effort trying to win at Laguna Seca when he started basically dead last and got all the way to second. So New Garden was really disappointed uh, at the end of the year, you know, or you know, getting six podiums, five wins, but. Those that that little pod, the early part of the season, he had five, two wins at Texas and Long Beach. And then outside of that, through the first six races of the season was not a whole lot. And in IndyCar, as you know, with some of the people that have been great, like the guy that finished third in points and we'll mention later on, you have to be consistent to win an IndyCar championship. You can win a lot of races, but it's a regular championship. You have to show up every race. It's not some uh, contrived playoff format like uh, NASCAR has or, um, you know, they or, you know, some other kooky element that is like you have a full season championship. So unfortunate for Joseph Newgarden, but he's going to be around. Uh, He's definitely somebody who is not going away. Penske is building the the organization around him to be the leader. also, I mean, a bigger, bigger story for him and bigger uh, part for him and his wife. They had their first child, so it was uh, congrats to them. And uh, being a dad's probably changing up a little bit for him, but looks like it made him drive a little better. Uh, gave him a little more urgency, I think. But I think that's going to be a motivator for him next year to go and uh, win that third championship. Somebody else though, that we've mentioned two Penske guys, Josh, uh, did you, did you have anything on new garden uh, and his season? Any thoughts on him before he moved forward? Well, I mean, you know, like I said earlier, I pointed out the, uh, you know, the wreck that he had in Iowa, you know, he was dominating that event, um, you know, dominated, I think would have won had it not been for that crash. And, you know, I think, that was a opportunity to get another win, and I think that would have been putting him, you know, closer to winning the championship. Because uh, if you look at you know the string of finishes from that Iowa win all the way to the end of the year, and even if you you know go back even further to the Indianapolis 500, the Iowa race was his worst. Uh, the second Iowa race was his worst race of the year. And I mean, it was worst finish overall. Well, not overall the year, but definitely the one that cost him uh, the most uh, or the opportunity. Um, you know, only scored nine points, you know, could have scored, you know, gone for the double and scored, you know, 53 points in that uh, event uh, like he did the previous day. So um, if that had not happened, you know, I think maybe we would have talked about willpower or yeah, well, as a, uh, second place finisher uh and we talk about joseph newgarden as a uh you know three-time indycar champion so um and you know a three-car car champion without the indianapolis 500 so um yeah that's that's really my takeaway from the season is that you know it, it takes a lot you know to win the championship and you have to it just shows and uh, illustrates that you, know, you really have to be consistent throughout the year to uh, be able to win the championship Absolutely. It's, it's what makes, that's one of the things that makes IndyCar so great. The, the variety of racetracks they run, the, the, you have to be able to be, uh, really solid in all aspects of your game and you can't give anything away. And then you have, of course, the 500, that is a double points race as well, which can flip the script a little bit, uh, depending on where you finish, uh, in terms of, uh, this, in terms of another person that uh, stands out, I would say that um, their uh, their teammate, their the former three time V eight Supercars champion Scott McLaughlin became uh, a star uh, this year. I don't think a lot of people were surprised by that, but you know uh, Scott McLaughlin, after a learning year last in twenty twenty one, came in this year and was guns a blazing uh, ends up getting three victories at St. Pete started from pole won the first race of the year almost won got passed right uh, it was a it was a photo finish with him and Joseph Newgarden at the line uh for the win at Fort Worth uh, and um so he had a good start to the year then the he started to struggle a bit that same 
basically portion of the season where Joseph Newgarden started having issues uh, happened. The same for, for Scott McLaughlin, a lot of bad finishes from Long Beach on through Belle Isle. And then a decent run at Elkhart Lake wins at Mid-Ohio, Toronto's whatever, Iowa run, he finishes 22nd. And that was probably where it all ended. Um, he had, After the Belle Isle race, he is down in 10th in points after being in third prior to the or after the Indianapolis GP and then he started chipping away from there from Belle Isle and where he was 10th in June he finished in the end he finished fourth in points needed and and he started showing the consistency that he needed to have um at from Iowa to on he didn't finish worse than sixth in any race and he and he won Portland which there was controversy with that with Will Power they were thinking oh maybe they'd Call t- team orders just to you, Joseph, or you can talk about Scott McLaughlin. Yeah, Scott McLaughlin, of course, just big up off of him. I mean, um, you know, going back to, you know, the beginning of the year, first race of the year started off St. Petersburg, Poland race win. And really, that was good, you know, showed what he could do, you know, the improvement from the year before where you know, Scott McLaughlin, um, you know, wasn't all that great. But, you know, he was able to defend his position, defend the win from uh, Alex Pelot, uh very close finish there. Um, but like you said, you know, throughout, uh, you know, after the Fort Worth, Texas finish uh, where, you know, had a chance to win the race and got passed in the final corner uh, by his teammate. You know, after that kind of uh, slowed down his season a little bit, um, you know, the Indianapolis 500 uh, ended up in a crash. Um, you know, with 50 laps to go and, uh, you know, didn't, you know, didn't really have anything, uh, in that race, you know, overall his team just wasn't, um, that good, you know, had, had the incident, you know, um, and everything and a really hard crash, but, you know, he was, ended up being okay in that one. Uh, you know, the Indianapolis Grand Prix, uh, didn't finish well in that one. Uh, and then, you know, after, after that, you know, El Cartlate started to be a little bit better for him over at, you know, Road America, a little bit better finish there. Uh, Mid Ohio came out with a victory, you know, one of the tougher courses in any car coming out with a win, uh, you know, coming out there and getting a win. That's a really impressive for a young driver. Uh, followed that up with the ninth place at Toronto, went to uh, Iowa, uh, finished 22nd in the first one, you know, six laps down. So really poor finish there. The second race or the, uh, the second race at Iowa finished third on the podium and then a fourth, second, third, and then another win at Portland. So, you know, uh, McLaughlin, another guy, if he had had a couple of better finishes here and there, you know, could have had a, a opportunity, you know, to end up, you know, finishing closer, maybe have a better shot at the title, uh, you know, more more uh, likely shot at the title, uh, especially that Iowa race where he finished twenty second. You know, if he had at least finished on the lead lap or something like that, or been closer to his teammate, you know, definitely uh, could have been a better you know better outcome for him for the championship. Uh, you know, he also you know third at at uh, Iowa Speedway or at um Gateway uh you know Speedway that that was a you know opportunity for him. Uh, got passed by. Uh, David Malukas there at the very end of that race, um, but you know McLaughlin and Newgarden were battling it out uh, at the end of that uh, Balmerito Automotive Group 500. Um, so you know, just a, a really solid year, I think, for Scott McLaughlin. I think you know we'll see a lot more of the performances that he put on throughout this year. Um, you know, in in 2022. So definitely hope that you know, he's able to continue that momentum, you know, looks like, um, you know, outside of Indianapolis Motor Speedway, you know, I think Penske is going to be the team to watch. Uh, we'll see, you know, what, you know, what type of product they bring to Indy for the 500 next year, you know, if they're able to have a little bit more speed this year, you know, they just didn't have the handling or anything like that this year to really be competitive. Like you need to be to, you know, be in contention for the, the win at, at the Indianapolis 500. So, you know, we'll definitely see, um, next year, you know, if they can, all three of these guys, Penske, um, you know, with New Garden, uh, McLaughlin, and Power, if they can repeat what they did in 22 and in 23. Yeah, the, to go and finish first, second, and fourth in points uh, was uh, in this in this field with how competitive it is. And for Scott McLaughlin to go and have a breakout, uh, he's going to work on that consistency. If you look at his Supercars career, 
He could win. He was very fast, but then he was inconsistent. Then as the years went on, he became better and better to the point where he became a dominant presence and he was the best driver in the series. So he's he's here. Uh, he has a ton of talent and potential and he's him and New Garden are basically the two guys that are going to carry that program for a while. And uh, Penske's got some two really good drivers, three really good drivers right now. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Yeah. <sighs> Sorry, um, I'll um, we'll go into Scott Dixon there, Josh. Um, another great consistent year for him. Yeah, of course. You know, with Scott Dixon, um, really great. You know, consistent throughout the year, um, as normal per usual from Scott Dixon. Um, but only you know a couple of victories this year. Uh, you know, he expected a little bit more out of him this season, but. Uh, you know, he had a chance at Indianapolis to win the Indianapolis 500, led 95 laps in that one, had the best car all day in that race. And then, you know, the last, you know, 20 laps, you know, last pit stop, you know, had the speeding penalty and cost him itself a, another chance at winning the Indianapolis 500. And that could have been a game changer for him uh, points wise, you know, um, finished 21st in a double points event. Uh, only scored 33 points and again you know this is a, you know pointed out with uh new garden and mclaughlin i mean this was the uh catalyst for scott dixon's season um even though yeah he's always been really consistent and everything but just this one 21st place finish uh compared to everything else just uh didn't have it in the table for him and changed uh his year because if he had won the indianapolis 500 you know it could very well have looked at uh, you know, a closer championship at least in Laguna Seca, um, and you know, possibly another title for uh, Scott Dixon. So, yeah, the, this was a um, disappointment uh, having a speeding penalty at Indy. Uh, otherwise, you know, that was a perfect race, and they definitely had the the um, organization wise. Uh, Ganassi had the cars to beat there, uh, and you know, of course, their teammate in uh, Marcus Erickson won that one. So. You know, uh, if it wasn't Erickson, it was probably going to be Dixon. So, yeah, th- th- this was just uh, unfortunate for Dixon. But, you know, otherwise, every race he raced in this year, except for the Indy 500 and the final race of the year at Laguna Seca, was uh, in the top 10. So, yeah, phenomenal year consistency-wise for uh, Scott Dixon. Yeah, and that's the one piece. I mean, if there's two things that we're going to look at why Scott Dixon is in seven time, uh, was that one error which is so rare for a guy who's one of the winning the second most winningest driver in the history of indycar racing a guy who's been doing this for now 22 years um in the main game and he's been a very consistent winner and relatively competitive for the better part of those 22 years and driven for ganassi for 20 um the longest tenured employee i think other than mike hull (laughs) or some of the mechanics but that error, I mean, he's wanted that second Indy 500 forever. And Josh is right. If he wins the Indy 500, we're talking about a whole different championship. Uh, because at that point, he was uh, he was fifth in points. His finish uh, after Indianapolis GP1, he wins the Indianapolis 500. I think he takes the points lead. So, so that was one. That was one. And then another piece that was an issue for, what is it, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine races was the poor qualifying. Um, if there's one uh, a second thing that, one main thing that'll stand out across the season, he qualified on pole at Indy, and he seems to become, he's become an expert at qualifying at Indy. That was his only pole of the year. But outside of that, his qualifying on road courses has been poor, and he's giving up so much space to Will Power or Joseph Newgarden or Scott McLaughlin that you can't make that up uh, easily in this field, and you can't give away that much to um, try and win a championship. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's unfortunate in that sense, but it shows Scott, how great Scott Dixon is. He was able to fade one of the toughest losses of his career and and rise above that and get himself all the way to third in points, um, as high as second after he'd won Nashville and finished third at Portland there. So won two races, uh, you know, earlier in the year, didn't have the speed, but he he came through. He's he's a, a smooth. He's the ice man for a reason. So um, only four podiums, which is interesting, but uh, not usual. 
but um, you know, breaks the the t- tie with uh, Mario Andretti. He's the second winningest driver in um, in IndyCar history, and uh, he gets to move into this new year. He's going to be running uh, part of the Cadillac the D the LMDH GTP program. He'll uh, also be, of course, running the PNC Bank number nine car um, and trying to win that seventh championship here in 2023. They'll have a lot. um, I figure the focus is going to be a little more towards Dixon relative to uh, his team teammates, uh, because to be fair, they're running like three and a half cars right now um, next year, not four. So they're going to have a little bit more commitment, I would think to making sure Dixon can come through. And they're going to need to put all hands on deck to beat Penske if they're going to run the way they did this past year. Uh, apologies for all the in and out and breaking out and me yelling on the mic. Uh, bathroom in our basement flooded, so it's flooded out into our uh, washroom area, which is right next, do- right next to it. So it seems to be an ongoing problem ever since we put that stupid toilet in there. And so, unfortunately, it's something that we need to fix there. Um, in let's move forward, though, Josh, and let's talk about the guy who you you mentioned it. The benefactor of Scott Dixon's mistake was his teammate Marcus Erickson uh, in the Husky Chocolate Number Eight, a biggest win of his career. Goes back to Sweden and takes the uh, Borg Warner Trophy. He ends up finishing sixth. In the championship, it was his only win of the year. Three podiums, but um, it. Who? I mean, at the end of the day, who cares? You won the Indianapolis 500. You're you're an Indy, Indianapolis 500 champion for life. And uh, Marcus Erickson, a journeyman driver in Formula One, drove for I think three teams to go and um, be able to go and win the Indianapolis 500 is a is a is a life changing. For Marcus Erickson. Yeah, of course. I mean, it's life changing for anybody to win the Indianapolis 500. Um, it's the race that everybody in IndyCar racing, in motorsports, dreams of winning. And, you know, this year, Marcus Erickson was able to achieve that goal. And, of course, it came at the expense of Scott Dixon's speeding penalty, like we said. And, you know, even with that, he still had to fight off Pato Award at the end of the race. Uh, you know, Award had a one opportunity to go out and pass him on the final lap of the race, and uh, he was able to, you know, with the speed of the Ganassi cars and the handling that they had uh, going into the corners, he was able to out out drive uh, Pat Award going into turn one on the final lap of the race, uh, starting the final lap to uh, you know, take back the position and hold uh, first place and win the race, uh, which actually ended up under ending under caution there. But um, you know, for Marcus Erickson, uh, yeah, definitely had opportunities throughout the year. Um, you know, he was the points leader, you know, for a good part of the summer. Uh, but then, you know, issues started popping up, you know, late in the season. Like he had the gearbox issue at Nashville, uh, which dropped him in points. Uh, didn't finish well at Portland and, you know, ended up dropping two spots at the end of the year at Laguna Seca to sixth place. Uh, you know, you, you can carry the points from the Indianapolis 500 all the way to the end of the year, you know, if you're able to stay consistent, but, you know, just didn't have that consistency towards the end of the year. And, uh, you know, we saw with Will Power and New Garden, they had a lot more pace, you know, post Indianapolis than I think the rest of the field and, you know, in- include, you know, all of Penske in that. And, you know, he also for Erickson this year, he had the uh, issue at a long beach at the end of the race, uh, you ended up pulling over, uh, and, you know, not, not completing the race had issues there. So, uh, you know, that's another place where you, you know, could have had more points at, um, something that, you know, um, definitely costly, you know, had a good run finishing, um, or could have finished in the, the top 10, I think, uh, and that one before, you know, getting caught up and, uh, having to pull over and, uh, you know, retire from the race so erickson i think you know is an interesting driver here in formula or in indycar um of course uh you know a year ago um 
you know, came out and won two races, both of them kind of by surprise, you know, especially the Nashville Grand Prix in 21. And, you know, like I said earlier, uh, or I've said in the past on the show is that, you know, since the Indianapolis 500 in 21, uh, he had actually been the best driver at Ganassi. And, you know, for, I think for a lot of the, the season in 22, you know, he carried over that uh, momentum and, you know, just uh, the, you know, end of the summer for him, uh, just didn't have, you know, the pace that he needed, uh, you know, to be able to, uh, carry that over into a championship, but, you know, nonetheless, he's been, uh, somebody, you you know, that people can watch out for, um, coming out to the end of the year. So, uh, be interesting to see where, uh, he goes in 23, um, you know, if, if he continues this type of performance or if he performs worse than his teammates, of course, um, we'll, we'll have to see what happens there. But, you know, I expect uh, him to be just as competitive as Scott Dixon and, you know, the rest of Ganassi uh, there. So, yeah, looking forward to seeing what uh, Erickson does in 2023. So we got uh, the plumber over here uh, talking to his kids or something, so... Uh, they just finished the service, so we'll see what's going on with that. But, um, yeah, Marcus Erickson, he's the Husky Chocolate, which isn't even sold here. Uh, I don't know what they are. I don't know if I'm assuming it's chocolate milk. I think it is, but uh, it's kind of like rich energy in a lot of ways, but ex- they, the, ca- the check's clear. Um, Erickson's there with Ganassi. He's um, uh, finishing sixth in points behind uh, you know, with with to go and win the Indy 500 is huge, um, and that's something that will never be taken away in his career for sure. Um, before we talk about the rookie battle, I think one person that deserves a little bit of uh, uh, consideration is Paddle Award. Uh, finished seventh in the standings this year, uh, won two races, won one pole. Uh, was uh, tied for the best average start uh, in the field with Joseph Newgarden. Uh, the consistency, he's building himself. He's getting better. The pace early in the year was not there for the Arrow McLaren team, which will now be Arrow McLaren. Next year, the SP part is gone. So the battle award goes and gets uh, a win at, win at Birmingham and Baba and then Iowa too. Take picking up the pieces from uh, New Garden, and then uh, you know four podium finishes total. He got both two of those at Iowa, Indianapolis, finishing second to uh, Erickson, and then of course Baba. So uh, making progress. One of the young guns in this series, tons of potential. Uh, you know, being twenty three years old or whatever he is, yeah, it's like he's twenty, yeah, twenty three years old, and. Um, you know, to, to he's moving. I mean, last year he was the interesting thing is he had similar statistics last year and he finished third in points. And then this year it was only good for seventh. It shows you how crazy um, the season was for all those Penske guys and the Ganassi guys that he only finished seventh. So, I mean, Paddle Award, though, uh, got signed by he's a part of McLaren's program to test Formula One cars. And I think he's a test and reserve driver for next year there. Uh, the def- former se- the 21 series champion Alex Palou, who ended up uh, in his title defense, not having as good of a year, uh, but finished fifth in points, won the last race of the season, and tied with Scott McLaughlin for the same amount of points. Um, award was in the mix last year, but the Penske and Ganassi domination take up the top six spots, so he's the best of the rest. And uh, now they're going to expand to a three car team. And his two now two teammates, Alexander Rossi and Felix Rosenquist, finish behind him. So uh, he's a leader, though, of that organization, that team. There's some changes coming along. Taylor Kyle uh, goes and moves over to work with his um, father-in-law or whatever, uh, nurse, whatever uh, uncle, I don't know, whatever the heck it is, at Ganassi with Mike Hall. And then I don't, I forgot who they hired to take over running the team. I think they. TGBB is a part of that, so we'll see how that works. But Pato Award definitely um, keeping himself in the mix, so close to winning that big one 
a couple of years ago, failed to qualify for the Indy 500 and then came so close to winning the Indy 500 this year. But he has the the ceiling is so high for him. Uh, there's a lot of good things coming in his future uh, for sure there, Josh. Yeah, of course. I mean, with uh, Pat Award, I mean, look at the beginning of the year for him. You know, there's talk about his struggles, of course, and, um, you know, the issues with his contract or, well, if, you know, he'd be re-signed uh, for, you know, 2013. Three and, and McLaren, they were able to reach a deal there uh, to extend. Um, of course, you know the you know had an issue with uh, beginning of the year, didn't really have the pace, and people were questioning him. But then he you know came out and win uh, the you know Barber Grand Prix out in you know Grand, Grand Prix of Alabama was able to get that win, uh, finished second in the Indianapolis 500, of course, and uh, you know had a had a chance to win there like. Like I talked about earlier, with when we were talking about Erickson, well, um, you know he had had a huge draft off the final corner, uh, coming to the last lap, and um, you know Erickson swerving back and forth trying to defend, and you have Award trying to you know steal the win and pulls out to the outside and gets right alongside of him, but he can't hold the position, doesn't have the handling, you know didn't have enough downforce to be able to you know keep up the momentum in the corner and had to you know surrender the position to Erickson. So got really close to winning his first Indianapolis 500, but uh, just came up that, you know, that much short from it. So, and, and, you know, additionally uh, had caution to end the race. So, uh, you know, it's um, really tough if he would have been able to, uh, had it ended under green, if he could have done something there to um, make a move at the end of the race. But, um, you know, he ended up getting the victory at Iowa, second oval, uh, victory you know last year he got the first career oval win at texas but you know he was the benefactor here of joseph newgarden's crash and took uh, advantage of that opportunity to take home the victory at iowa um of course uh, there's also the inconsistencies like uh you know with the beginning of the year but then also uh in the middle of the season you know with uh road america uh they were running pretty well um you know they had qualified fifth place and then they had the engine failure towards the end of the race, um, which um, was really, you know, not what they needed, you know, to be able to compete for the championship. Um, and, you know, they fell from third to fourth in points. And then then they won the pole at mid-Ohio and then had issues with their fuel system at the beginning of the race and, um, you know, just didn't have anything. So, you know, those two races there, you know, you can't have two races back-to-back and expect to win the championship uh, in, in any car, two races back-to-back of DNFs. And then, you know, later on had the crash at Nashville, uh, you know, late in the race or, well, not late, but um, early on in the race. So, um, you know, otherwise they had a fairly good year, um, pretty consistent for the most part, um, just, you know, a lot of issues where they couldn't finish. Uh, so, you know, um, or a handful of races where they couldn't finish. So if he's able to, you know, put it together, if McLaren can put it uh, together, they can be a challenger uh, to Ganassi, they can be a challenger to Penske, and you know I could um, see him getting a you know at least a top three points finish if things go right uh, at the end of twenty three. So um, it's going to be up to him. He's getting a new teammate with Alex Rossi, so I think Rossi is going to help the team a lot and be able to inject some you know new knowledge into that team and help them get better overall across the board. That is a hope with their expansion and. Uh, bringing in a veteran and Alexander Rossi, who's been a Honda driver his whole IndyCar career, been with Andretti his whole career, now coming to McLaren, uh, Arrow McLaren. So what he'll be able to bring a lot of experience there. You have Rosenquist came from Ganassi. Um, see what can happen with that team. Uh, last piece we'll go over before we move into the roundup uh, it was the great rookie battle that took place this year. Christian Lundgaard ends up winning the Rookie of the Year for Ray Hall Letterman Lanigan Racing. In turn, he's getting um, the the high V sponsorship for next year, and will be running the uh, forty five. Essentially, a branding. They're just doing a branding shift. Uh, teams are staying the same, but essentially, he's swapping uh, the his deal with uh, Jack Harvey, his teammate. Uh, after Jack Harvey basically looked like a hack the whole year. And um, 
His girlfriend's beautiful, but he didn't drive great, and he hasn't really been that great his whole entire IndyCar career, to be fair. But, um, yeah, so Lungard gets the Rookie of the Year, a guy who uh, made a great uh, debut uh, in his uh, at Indianapolis GP2 uh, in uh, 2021, and that essentially was why he got the ride. Uh, he got a ninth-place finish in the first Indianapolis GP, uh, finished eighth at Toronto, then Indy GP2, uh, finished second, and then um, eighth in Nashville, fifth at Laguna Seca, gets him the, the rookie of the year over David Malukas, who Josh mentioned earlier. He's the he's going to be the lead driver at uh, Dale Coyne Racing now, and um, his dad brings the money to the table, but he's... He's shown talent. It's not like he, it's not all daddy's money deal. Uh, but the consistency for the Dale Coyne team wasn't there compared to other years. Uh, Indianapolis was basically the first time where Malukas was able to kind of show some of his stuff, you know, qualifying just outside of the, the fast, whatever the, the fast group, or I think it's a top 12 or 10 or some crap, uh, finished 16th. But, Finished 12th the race in the Indy GP1. Texas, he finished 11th. And he kind of started, and he started making progress after Road America, finishing the top 10 in mid-Ohio. Iowa 2, finishing 8th. And then, of course, Gateway, which he had the, they had great pitch strategy to get him there uh, to second place. And it was a huge result for that team. And now he's going to be the team leader. So the, even though we don't know what is going to happen after next year, but as it stands, uh, David Malukas is a, a young talent, young American driver with potential, and um, Dale Coyne is going to want to hold on to him uh, because otherwise they don't really have anything going at the moment. They're going to lose. They're losing their former driver, full-time driver, uh, to Ganassi most, more than likely, and we don't know who's going to take over that ride. The uh, Rick Ware, uh, Dale Coyne ride, but more than likely it's an F2 driver, Josh. So it's, um, and then we, and I don't, I'd be remiss to not, um, if I didn't mention, uh, the likes of, uh, Callum Eilat, who qualified on the front row at, uh, Laguna Seca in the final race of the season. And then, uh, Kyle Kirkwood, who had a lot of DNFs, uh, crashed, uh, crashed a lot of cars, uh, and uh, unfortunately for A.J. Foyt, but um, he has a ton of speed. And immediately after Alexander Rossi was signed by Arrow McLaren, uh, soon after that, Andretti Autosport brought Kyle Kirkwood back. And he's going to be driving the 27 car for them next year to be the teammate of uh, Colton Herta. And they'll he'll be the veteran driver of that team somehow, Colton Herta. So great rookie class this year. Struggled, of course, because of how competitive IndyCar is, but the reality is there's some guys there that have the potential uh, to really stand out and make things happen here as the years go on. Yeah, of course. And, you know, we talk about the rookies and kind of a change in the com- the com- uh, composition of the rookies, you know, from 21, you know, the 21 class of rookies was very star studded with, you know, with Jimmy, Scott McLaughlin and Roman Grosjean. And now we have kind of a normal class where you have a bunch of young guys, you know, from feeder series um, or from, you know, elsewhere from international, um, from the international feeder series coming here to uh, IndyCar and, and being able to, you know, go out and, show what type of talent they have and all these guys shine in different ways. Like you said, um, you know, uh, Cal Myla, you know, had the great qualifying effort, uh, at the end of the year at, uh, Laguna Seca. Um, and you know, had a good run, a couple of good runs, you know, had the first in Indianapolis, uh, Grand Prix where he finished in seventh place or in eighth place, started seventh. Uh, that was ended up being his best result of the year. Um, but he had good pace, you know, throughout some of the races, um, consistently, uh, um, you know, at, at Iowa finished 11th and 12th, um, uh, during that double hitter event. Um, you know, David Malukas, of course, you talked about him earlier with the, basically the, one of the best runs by rookie we've seen on Oval, you know, coming out and having good strategy, good speed and, um, challenging for, um, 
the win, challenging for podium at uh, Gateway. Um, yeah, especially in the type of car, Dale Coyne, they've always been kind of an underdog team that, you know, could potentially challenge. And, um, you know, he's once again, another driver that has that, uh, capability of being able to go out and, um, make moves when he needs to. So, you know, that was a good effort there. Um, Lundgaard, of course, like you said, uh, before, you know, he had a, um, solid overall season as a rookie in IndyCar, um, you know, towards the end of the year, started to figure things out, you know, had a couple, you know, had a podium at, at Indianapolis, finished top five at Laguna Seca, had a, a good run at Nashville. So, you know, he, he could be a guy, you know, in the um, future for uh, Ray Hall, Letterman, Lanigan uh, could be somebody um, that they put a lot into, um, especially, you know, considering, you know, how much longer Graham Ray Hall might want to race for, we don't know, but, you know, he could be, um, you know, definitely closer to the end of his career than uh, Christian Lungard, obviously at the beginning of his career. So he could be somebody that they invest in uh, for, you know, future years. So we'll have to see there. And, you know, of course with uh, Kyle Kirkwood, you know, he had uh, his moments throughout the year. Um, a lot of crashes, like you said, but, you know, I think one moment that stands out to me is uh, I think, you know, he had a, a run at Fort Worth at, at Texas. I uh, remember, I mean, you pointed him out and, um, you know, there was a point where, you know, he was hooked up, you know, for a little bit in that race and had a lot of speed, had a lot of, uh, pace. Uh, yep. And he was leading too. So, um, could have had a better race there, but ended up crashing out of that event. Um, so, you know, we know what he can do, um, on an oval when he has the opportunity, when he has the, the car underneath him and, and the pace, uh, so now going to Andretti taking over uh, for Alexander Rossi. Um, we'll see if the consistency improves, you know, going from crashing just about every other week to maybe having better chance at a victory and certainly teaming up with, you know, guys like Roman Grosjean and uh, teaming up with Colton Herta, um, two really good drivers, you know, certainly help you grow and develop here in the series. So, uh, you know, I think, I think he has a lot of potential and, you know, certainly I think out of, um, all the rookies we talked about, you know, I'm kind of looking at him as somebody that can definitely, uh, you know, be, you know, one of the more improved drivers in 2023, uh, you know, in this entire series. So, you know, all, all these rookies really had their moments throughout the year and, um, you know, looking forward to seeing how they continue to grow in 23. Absolutely. I mean, next year's rookie class is uh, probably not as flashy, but I mean, if Linus, uh, Linus Lundquist can somehow or another get on the grid, probably would help it a bit. But um, this class showed a lot of talent and potential, and there's probably three uh, of those guys, if not four of them, that could uh, keep it, stay here in IndyCar for a while and have a lot of talent. And I mean, it was a good point you made there, Josh, about how Green Rehaul, we don't know how long he's going to be around with all his business entities he's got going on. Uh, the fact that he's now the father of two daughters with uh, Courtney Force, I think those pieces there are are uh, things that could play into that decision. The notion of trying to be a more competitive franchise or team. Um, what's going there, Susie? Um, so we'll we'll see what happens with that and that team and this organization as they go along, and in general uh, for all these drivers and what they're able to do. So let's get into the roundup uh, here. Uh, the big big news that came out today on Monday, the 12th, was uh, the SRX series will move to ESPN after being on CBS the last two years and on Saturday nights on and, uh, during the summer. They'll be in the summer, of course, again, but they'll be on ESPN, and they'll be running on Thursdays, and they're going to bring back the Thursday Night Thunder uh, moniker that, you know, famously many years ago. It's one of the things I I loved watching was Wednesday Night Thunder, Thursday Night Thunder. It's where I found out who Tony Stewart was. Jeff um, Gordon, too. Jeff Gordon became a thing there. Um, no Neck, Ryan Newman, uh, late the late Kenny Irwin Jr., uh, the list goes on and on. There's guys that ran in NASCAR, Stevie Reeves, who's now a spotter, Randy Tolzma, and guys who ran in the IRL that ran in USAC on, on Thunder. Um, going back to the 80s, the 
late Rich Vogler, who would always seem to be a guy that would they'd call in at the last second to go and qualify a car in the Indy 500. You know, there there, there are so many great names that drove on those Thunder broadcasts over the years when they had the original show, uh, original show, and they had Dave Despain and, uh, you know, with that open. And that's what I'm saying. I, I hope that they get Dave Despain. He's sitting out in the wilderness in the woods in Georgia, but have him, uh, if he can go and record the open or something, that'd be awesome. I just want to, it would be cool to just have that same cool um, intro like they used to have back in the day. Um, I figure other than, I know that it seems like Tony, I would assume Tony and Marco, if his wrist can hold up and that imbecile Paul Tracy will all be back. Uh, I think Paul Tracy's trying to run TA2 or something, fit his fat ass in that car. So, uh, But yeah, that's the big news. They're going to be on Thursday night uh, in the summer on ESPN, Josh. And people are certain people are saying that that might be a, a sign that ESPN might be interested in other motorsports. They're already invested in Formula One and showing it with the uh, Sky F1 uh, feed. But in this case, you know, you're going to have maybe there will be a little bit more input with ESPN involved. Uh, it sounds like Alan Bestwick is still connected to the vehicle, so that'll be good to have Alan Bestwick uh, still around. He is He does work for ESPN calling college football, college basketball, tennis. So um, AB, of course, call, called NASCAR for ESPN for many years, both in the lead the lead uh, announcer role and then um, was a pit road, lead pit road guy uh, prior to that, I think, um, before they moved him up because Marty Reed was garbage. So uh, what were you thinking uh, about when you heard that, Josh? Is uh, big news for them. I mean, the ratings are not great. But I think putting it on Thursday nights can't hurt. Yeah, it certainly can't hurt for, you know, Thursday nights. Um, you know, we'll see what the schedule comes out, you know, exactly, you know, what the races are going to be like and where they're going. But um, Thursday night, Thunder, you know, it's been it was a motorsports tradition, you know, in the late 80s, early 90s. So great to bring back that tradition. And, um, you know, I think ESPN from a television coverage standpoint, um, you know, I wasn't sure, you know, how much committed they are to American motorsports. Obviously, they're already committed to Formula One. Uh, but, you know, I think it's a good opportunity to grow uh, for SRX. Um, you know, of course, they were already on big network television with uh, CBS uh, and the SRX. But, you know, I just never felt like that they really um, had, you know, a share hold on, on TV. I mean, I think initially some of their ratings were probably pretty good, but I don't think that they really, um, you know, had a presence on CBS. Um, you know, I think CBS outside of the NFL, the AFC and the occasional NFC game, and then you have um, college basketball. It doesn't really seem like CBS has much of a sports presence outside of that. So I think going to a college network. Football that, and golf too. Yeah. Oh yeah. And golf, golf too. Yeah. Jim Nance at the masters. So those are really the big, the big three. And then, yeah. And college football, the SEC on CBS, that is true in the, Army Navy games, so they do have their their sports presence, but outside of that, there isn't really um, very much, and and all of those are very seasonal uh, events or once a year. Whereas ESPN, you know, very round the clock sports network. Um, I think um, if you want to expand to other people watching sports, I think you know having them marketed on on you know pages where you know there's sports uh, content from ESPN. I think that's better uh, for you know, better for the SRX. Maybe if something wild happens on SRX, we're going to see uh, Stephen A. going talking about it the next day. Um, that would be interesting, um, but I doubt it. <laughs> and, you know, you mentioned the thing with, you know, maybe they get collaborated with Sky Sports. I mean, it's another degree to get closer to um, – a degree of separation closer to Lewis Hamilton if Tony um, is able to somehow finagle something together for Lewis Hamilton to make a surprise appearance on SRX on Thursday Night Thunder. That would be interesting. Um, so I, I guess it's possible because there's a little bit more connection. You know, he's got the Formula One connection already with Gene Haas. Could go and hey, what's up, Lewis? Let's go, let's go uh, dirt tracking at Eldora on SRX or you know everything Sky Sports. You know. 
hit him up. Hey, Sky, um, we can do a, a connection there and have a double broadcast or something on Sky Sports and ESPN in the States uh, with SRX if Lewis were to ever uh, show up. And, you know, Tony and Lewis are friends, I guess. So could happen. I don't know. But um, certainly it's a possibility. But, um, yeah, I think uh, it's better for the series, better for uh, the network. Um, and even though, you know, generally I think going from – uh, you know, network television down to cable broadcast. Um, generally, I think that's a step down. But, you know, I think ESPN, I think they'll be able to, um, you know, make up for that. So um, should be interesting seeing them next year during the week. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, the net, we don't know what it really means. I think it may depend a lot on who they get to drive. Um, it's a good point you brought up with uh, uh, having Lewis or, you know, insert some surprise driver here, you know, that would be huge to get guys like him or some guys that are legendary sports car racers, or hopefully they, they add, I don't know if there's any road course that has, well, Daytona, um, and that has lights. So maybe I should get Daniel Ricardo. He's free. <laughs> yeah. That would be the other one. Um, Daniel Ricardo or Lewis Hamilton would probably be huge. Uh, if they can go and do that, but that's something we will figure out uh, later on, I guess, um, as uh, next few months go by and we get into 2023. Uh, but on you know Jay Ski, that plenty of news since the last time we had our show. Uh, you know, they put Arco is going to be on all Fox Sports, but nobody watches or nobody cares really. Uh, Josh Balicki, because. Um, what is it? Uh, Spire is going to run two full-time cars. He's moving his sponsorship and stuff to the Live Fast Chevy program. They're moving from Ford to Chevy with ECR engines. Uh, going back to uh, last week, Sammy Smith and John Hunter Nemechek were announced as drivers full-time for Joe Gibbs Racing the Xfinity Series. Another sponsorship announcement for Josh Berry, Ryan Truex is going to run six races in the 19 car. So that looks like they're going to reduce from four to three teams. They'll run the 18, 19, and 20. Uh, Kaz Gralla will be driving uh, full-time for Sam Hunt Racing in Toyota in the Toyota number 26. And then uh, they're going to run a second car with uh, Trans Am uh, driver Connor Mos- Mosak will be... Uh, the driver that gets the most starts, it looks like. He's the anchored driver, they say there. And um, Brett Moffitt, uh, the in the maggot imbecile he is, and COVID denier found the perfect team uh, because Austin Wayne Self's uh, dad or whoever uh, felt like that's a match made in heaven. Two imbeciles work together. They're going to run full-time AM, whatever, racing well, AM Racing is going to run full time in the Xfinity series. They were they put their they dipped their toe in a couple of races late in the year this year, and now they're taking a full commitment. They're getting the former Truck Series champion who was fired by or let go by Hour Racing, and considering that Hour Motorsports looks like they're going to be done, uh, probably didn't work out so bad for old Brett Moffat. But um, they're going to run. They're going to be connected to Stuart Haas Racing, and uh, they're going to get Fords. They'll be running Fords with uh, that SHR Technical Alliance and then the Ford Performance Racing, the Roush Yates Engines, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Kevin Sawinski runs the team, so former ASA champion uh, there. And then they're going to be – so in, on top of that, they're going to have – they're going to be connected, it looks like, to the two Stuart Haas cars with uh, Cole Custer and Riley Herbst. I think Ford is trying to make more of an investment in the lower series, which we'll get into in a moment. Um, but, yeah, they're going to – the the AM racing team is going to re – they're going to make – they're they're going to run a F-150 in the truck series, and then they're going to be running – they're going to run Ford's – in uh, arca next year so that'll be something to look at there uh we we also had other news in the truck series so the what's it called here you know 12 5 is dean thompson joins tricon garage or whatever so he can go and run in the back but raja karuth was announced to drive for gms 
Uh, they'll have Brand Enfinger and uh, who coming back, and then Daniel Die will be uh, uh, so they'll be running. He'll be running, bringing coming up from the Arca series as well. Uh, Nut Puncher Daniel Die. Uh, so two rookies there, Brajak Ruth and Daniel Die, making with the veteran Grand Enfinger at GMS or running Chevys, of course. Christian Eckes. Uh, leave store sport and he'll join the McAnally Hilgeman team and uh, Jake Garcia will also be driving for that team next year door sport this is a big piece uh, looks like they'll switch back to Ford of course it doesn't really matter because they're just really the engines are all the same it's just really bodies that's the only quote identity that there is with the truck series uh, going back to Ford and in turn they're going to hire Haley Deegan so that'll be interesting uh, with that, bringing her in the fold at Door Sport Racing with uh, three other drivers, or I'm trying, uh, two drivers that have won a champ- championships uh, in this series, and then Ty Majeski, who um, was in the final four this, this season and is one of the best late model drivers, super late model drivers that exist. So be an interesting dynamic there with Haley Deegan. Uh, there are a lot of crew chief announcements. Chad Walter and Travis Sharp will be moving. They will be working for GMS. Chad Walter will be working with Roger Carruth. And Travis Sharp will uh, be working with uh, Daniel Dye. Who would be, he's got experience with him. And then has uh, worked with Jesse Love at Bill McAnally's team. So in the ARCA West, a lot of experience there. Other announcements in terms of crew chiefs, Danny Stockman will be a part of stay with Kyle Busch Motorsports with uh, Nick Sanchez and uh, uh, Rev Racing Connection. And then Jimmy Villeneuve, who's been a car chief for uh, Kyle Busch Motorsports for the last few years, will be working with the full-time number four of Chase Purdy. Carson Hosevar is going to come back full-time for Nice. So yeah, that's I think that covers everything. In terms of the NASCAR news, you can check that out on JSKI, of course. Uh, a couple of pieces in terms of Formula One that came out today. Uh, Joe Scapito uh, leaves as the steps down as the team principal at Williams, and FX De Mason, which is quite a name, uh, leaves as the technical director. So huge news prior to the Christmas holiday. Two of the big play, big people at Williams are leaving. I have our heart. I don't know who they're going to get at this point. I'm kind of tough to have that kind of uh, situation happen at this point of the year. Uh, Honda has put in you know, registered with the FIA for the new engine formula, the power unit supplier, whether that means they're going to reconnect with Red Bull or actually make an engine, they'll make a power unit and then work with another team. Is still to be determined there. Um, but yeah, they end up uh, putting in to uh, come back into Formula One again. Uh, other news that you can see on motorsport.com uh, Qatar will hold the opening race of the WEC uh, calendar starting in 2024. Uh, there's a thing about Loeb, he's probably not going to be able to run Monte Carlo even after winning it last year for Ford. And Oliver Turvey with DS Penske in Formula E, which will start in January, a few weeks away from that. Owasso's in Formula 2, stays with the Dams team, uh, the Honda and Red Bull connected driver there. So that'll be uh, something to see. He'll run with Artur Leclerc as his teammate. And trying to see what else is in play there. And... I have, yeah, that's that's about it for those pieces. Um, IMSA ran at uh, Daytona this past weekend for testing for the uh, the new GTP category, and that was uh, a big uh, big deal with the amount of uh, data they're trying to collect and trying to figure out these cars, getting them to run uh, prop run properly, of course. Um, you go and have other news. I mean, Kevin and Jan Magnuson are going to run the Rolex 24, I guess, in GT, GTM. I think that's GT, 
Daytona, uh, Mark Kwame. So is it, you know, they're going to run. Tell you if I'm trying to look at uh, uh, Daytona. Uh, 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 MDK is going to come in. Yeah, so, yeah. So Kevin, yeah, what's it called? Mark Kwame runs the team, and uh, Jan Magnuson will be back in IMSA. So that will be cool. Uh, Inception Racing runs the McLaren 720. will be running uh, full-time next year so that'll be a nice addition the gt daytona category in um yeah imsa got that going through that dryer yeah so you got uh testing from last weekend you have the um there were reliability issues largely brought on by the new uh what do you call um the hybrid system or not hybrid the the uh the the control uh, systems that they've had to add to these cars have um, have made brought on some reliability issues. But at the end of the day, four manufacturers brought cars, two cars a piece, uh, two or three car in the case of Cadillac, three cars, but two cars from Honda, Acura, two cars from Porsche, Penske, and then two cars from Cad, three cars from Cadillac, two for Ganassi's team, and then one for Action Express. And then BMW, Ray Hall, Letterman, Lanigan all ran. Uh, there were, you know, teething issues, but you know, hopefully, we'll see what happens with the, those cars. It, they're talking about it's going to be a race of attrition, having to make it through 24 hours. It may not be a full-out sprint as it has been uh, in recent years with the DPI category. And so something to look at, but the cars look cool. The Cadillac is sounds awesome and it's going to run in the world endurance championship. So it's going to be an, uh, a cool thing to see the one uh, Ganassi Cadillac running at Le Mans with the big, big five and a half liter V8 amongst all those turbo cars. Uh, that'll be a cool one. And then um, Acura is there. They've won the last couple of championships. They've won the Rolex the last couple of years. So Momentum has been on their side. Penske comes back with the Porsche program uh, this next year. What are they going to do? Um, expectations are high, of course. And then you have BMW with Ray All Letterman Lanigan uh, trying to go and get that team off the ground. BMW, of course, is going to run in both series starting in 2024. Porsche is planning on running in both the uh, uh, IMSA and World Endurance Championship. And, um, of course, Cadillac is there. Acura has not committed as of yet to any World Endurance Championship uh, races for next year, but I guess it'll we'll see what happens with that. Colin Braun will be the uh, new teammate of Tom Blomquist at uh, at uh, Meyer Shank Racing, defending series champions. So that'll be a lot to look at of course next month it'll be where we're about six weeks away from the rolex so we'll definitely talk about it once we get there and uh, see what happens with that so the i think that's the end of the roundup for me uh josh you can go and tell us what what it's like uh with your new setup here on the uh sim segment yeah of course you know it's um been uh very fun racing on iRacing the last couple of days uh, mostly just been doing practice laps on my own, trying to get used to it. Um, but I got new pedals for my uh, rig. Uh, you know, I upgraded from the Logitech G27 pedals to the uh, Fanatec uh, Club Sport V3 uh, pedals. And, uh, you know, most importantly, you know, what I wanted to, why I wanted to do it is uh, to get a load cell break. Uh, pedal and um, it's a lot more a lot more accurate I think it takes a lot more force uh, to be able to um, you know hit hit the brakes um, I think yeah real race cars are supposed to have uh, very stiff braking systems and your brake pedals and um, the brake pedal is uh, currently configured to you know be uh, pretty stiff I've uh, done a lot of uh, configuring around trying to play with some of the settings you know you you have the ability to adjust how much load you can put in the brake um, you know you can go for like the highest setting which makes it super super stiff or you can go for softer one um, and then there's like some additional settings uh, in in the uh, uh, settings 
uh, application, the uh, configuration application for the, the pedals, and you can increase the load from that. So I've been trying to play around, and I think I've got something uh, that I like. And then on top of that, there's also, um, they have a, a kit that you can buy alongside the pedals, and it's basically like um, a couple of pieces of uh, polyurethane foam that you can um, put in combination with, like, so you have two colors, green and red, that are uh, ones like... Uh, bit more of stiffness than the other one and then you know you stick that inside the uh the cylinder for the load cell and you can actually um you know have a bit stiffer uh brakes brake pedal that way so i've done a combination of those three settings and i think i found something i like and i was joking with my friends um you know I might get a leg workout while i'm playing on the sim racing stuff um so additional exercise i guess and it makes sense you know when these uh, drivers and get out of the car, you know, not only are they mentally and physically fatigued from the heat and, you know, however long they're racing um, and everything, but also you have to consider how, you know, the movement that their legs does, you know, inside, inside the car, you know, switching between braking and, you know, applying the throttle. And, you know, even if, um, you know, you're still using a clutch, like, well, you know, in Xfinity or in trucks on the road courses, you know, heel toe. So definitely takes a lot. So, um, yeah, definitely, um, gonna feel maybe a little bit of that you know so we'll see how much but um oh yeah and the clutch pedal on on this uh thing um is very very responsive and um it doesn't actually engage at full position until you get to 100 percent. and it almost yeah i guess it feels like i've never actually used a clutch in real life but i mean kind of has the responsiveness that you'd normally get from a clutch uh it seems like or feels like so um yeah, it's definitely pretty fun so far. Um, you know, I've been trying to improve on the road racing side, and that's really what I wanted, you know, to have better better performance on the road racing side. And people were saying, if you want to get faster, you know, you should try to upgrade your pedals because you'll get a lot more consistent braking with uh, load cell than um, the uh, entry-level stuff uh, that Logitech and other companies have. So, um, yeah, I've been racing the ferrari uh gt3 uh at various tracks throughout the week uh, i was racing or driving the uh new toyota gr86 the miata the mazda miatas that they have on there uh did a little bit of testing with the indy car at Watkins glen uh tried nascar at martinsville uh you know with heavy short track braking um so yeah it's been pretty interesting did a little bit of laguna seca daytona with uh the ferrari gt3 so um yeah i've been trying to uh you know just get better and so far in my testing uh i've been pretty fast been pretty consistent with my laps so i'm really liking it so far and you know um haven't done too much racing with it just a little bit last week you know trying to still get used to it and everything so i think you know later this week i'll try to hop on and get more reps in um you know definitely definitely like it and you know i think uh it's going to make me better as a sim racer and and hopefully you know i can put out some more road racing content on there um you know try to focus i've been focused more on oval racing and i do occasionally do road racing but um i you know like to expand a little bit more into it so um definitely definitely something to look into and you know if you can get that kind of setup you know definitely try to go for it because it's well worth i think it's well worth the cost and you know just alone from the build quality you know uh stainless steel brushed you know brushed stainless steel um and uh just uh you know metal and everything whereas the g27 the pedals the pedal faces were uh stainless steel but then everything else plastic so um you know something you know to upgrade from and now you have uh, something that's really high quality so um yeah definitely try to get that if you can but um definitely well worth the price but yeah that's pretty much all i have on sim segment because you know, i just wanted to talk about my pedals and everything so um yeah i'll be racing on i racing probably this week later on and everything a little busy at at the job this week so probably have to wait a little bit towards the weekend for that but um yeah i was able to you know get that and everything and actually it came on saturday it was supposed to be delivered the pedals were supposed to be delivered on friday but wasn't home and then they took it you know fedex uh you know needed a signature so they came back the next day and was able to install it on saturday so you know spent uh 
time on Saturday and Sunday playing around with it. But yeah, definitely, definitely like it and um, look forward to upgrading the steering wheel and the steering wheel base to get the full setup uh, soon. So we'll see how long we'll wait to do that. But um, gotta gotta figure out the setup there. But at least have have the pedals there because that's I think what's really going to make the difference. But yeah, that's uh, pretty much all I got. And you'll see see me later in the week on iRacing, I guess. But you can follow that at um at UCLO2 my twitch uh yeah twitch.com slash UCLO2 go on twitch tv slash UCLO2 go in there and watch all my sim segments and uh sim racing content when I post on there so um probably start practicing up I guess for the Rolex 24 uh in January at some point I think I'd like to do it just got to figure out some people to go run it with and then um you know try to make an attempt you know so um and then I'll probably go watch the real World X24, as I said before. So go for both of those things. So watch it, the real one and then go play in the fake one. So um, there'll be something to look forward to. Um, of course, you can see all my content and um, you know, all, all my opinions on my Twitter page uh, at JP Huffine. Go on there and see you know everything I have to say about football, racing, and uh, news and all that stuff. So um, you know, uh, go on there and you know, engage and interact, follow, whatever. So, uh, yeah, follow me on there at JP Huffine. And of course, go on your YouTube channel and subscribe and like our page there. Are all our videos from this uh, show uh, at Grip Share Podcast, Grip Share Podcast on YouTube. Go on there and see uh, everything we've, uh, you know, been posting and everything. So, um, yeah, glad to, of course, be able to do with you, Phil, every week. So, um, yeah, look forward to um, having another show to close out the year and, um, you know, talk about all the stuff and, you know, hopefully we'll find out here in a uh, little bit, if you make it into the fantasy playoffs, um, I'm already locked in by virtue and I just have to worry about seeding. Uh, so we'll see if, um, you make it in, hopefully you do, um, so we can verse each other again and have a little bit more content to talk about next week. If, uh, you know, we face each other, uh, in the, in the following weeks. So, you know, we'll see, uh, how it goes there, but yeah, I always, uh, glad to be able to do it and have that opportunity to have fantasy football and be in this league with you. Absolutely, man. Wouldn't want to do it with anyone else. Uh, I think you're going to end up being the four seed. So I would need a miracle to get the five, uh, as it stands before I go and do my close. Uh, Josh is up by, what is it? Uh, 20, two ish points uh james connor is having a solid game you know that's a 13 13 tie right now middle of the third quarter you know around 22 points mac jones hasn't done much anything for new england but they're still in this game and then um i mean other than that in terms of other players in the league and uh, what is it steve who will probably be your matchup next week uh, he has Ramondre Stevenson and Buda Baker uh, playing, and uh, so he has some opportunity there the rest of the game. You know, we'll see what happens with that. As it stands, the live standings show me as um, am I going over there? Yeah, so it would show me as the getting in right on the bump. Uh, Steve would end up facing you, Josh, and I would face Professor J in the wild card round. But gonna need. Need it to hold. Uh, need James Connor to eventually be shut down because uh, it's getting kind of tight here. But you can find me at Philip G Matthew on Twitter. You can find us at Gripstrip Pod on Twitter. Uh, the Gripstrip Podcast. You can find it anywhere. There's podcasts. You can find the Gripstrip Podcast. Um, we'll uh, be around next week for the last episode of 22. Episode 149 will be in. Um, is that a turnover? Yeah, it is. Uh, a turnover for the Arizona Cardinals. I think it's an interception return for a touchdown uh, there. No, it was so, a fumble return for a, a touchdown. touchdown. Yeah, it is Colt McCoy. is good for either of those. Um, we'll be back for episode 149 next week of the Gripster Podcast, talking plenty NFL. Uh, we'll see if there will be fantasy content from my side. Uh, definitely be it for Josh because he has a game to play next week for sure. I got eliminated uh, out of one league for sure. And who knows, maybe if some point scoring errors come through, maybe on changes are made, maybe we back into the playoffs in one of them and 
I'm definitely backing into the playoffs if I somehow or another uh, get in here. And then in terms of motorsports recap, still really debating which one I want to do uh, before we go. This is the last show of the year before we take our usual holiday break. So we will keep you in suspense for episode 149. Uh, you'll just have to listen to it. Uh, thanks to everyone that does listen and support us here on the GSP. Uh, for Josh, I'm Phil. Take care. God bless. Goodbye.